Hey BookTube, it's David from Live Forever Die Try here, and today I want to tell you about my favorite three books of 2021. Now, overall, it's actually a solid year as far as the quality of books read, even though I didn't hit my goal on quantity of books read. So um, as many of you know, I came up a little short, only reading 30 books instead of the 52 that was my goal. Uh, so whereas last year I did a top five best of, I'm trimming that down to a top three uh, this year. Now, the reason I picked these books, funnily enough, two of these were actually four star reads originally, but as 2021 developed and I found certain influences on my life, uh, made me come to certain questions that these books were guiding me on, I guess is the best way to say it. These are books that have kind of sat with me and I mauled over a lot of the points brought up. So even though on first glance I rated some of these four out of five, um, they definitely became my favorites, even though at first glance I might not have got as much of a perceived value out of them. Um, but without further ado, let's jump into the books themselves. Um, so first up, I have After Geoengineering by Holly Jean Buck, uh, subtitled here, Climate Tragedy, Repair and Restoration. Now, if you're unfamiliar, geoengineering is human innovation to affect climate change or human intervention, rather is what I meant to say. So we're talking about stuff like simple technologies, growing big kelp forest to secure carbon or sequester carbon out of the atmosphere, um, all the way up to giant air filters that scrub the air, deposit carbon out of it, or even fake clouds, basically, where you throw up some of these reflective particles that either reflect light back into the air or trap moisture to make artificial clouds. And this is a controversial technology to even talk about, geoengineering. You're changing the environment, which might have severe implications for other parts of the world. Maybe you're heating up or cooling down certain areas of the ocean that are redirecting, um, what they call it, just currents or uh, jet streams. Um, or maybe you're creating clouds in one part, which is going to stop the moisture from going to another part of your country and causing rains and maybe droughts in a different area. Or talk about country on country. If one country is doing this and the rest of the world isn't, what are the implications? However, we're at a point in history where corporations control 80% of the output of greenhouse gases, and it doesn't look like we're really slowing down too much. So I think there's going to be a part where this is required. Now, specifically what this book talks about after geoengineering, in my opinion, what Holly Jean Buck is doing is considering what type of society we currently have that uses this technology and what type of society that then creates. This book is written as a combination of interviews with people who either build or are affected by this tech, um, as well as scientists and researchers, really cutting edge, kind of bleeding edge science, which is super interesting to me on a lot of this, it explains how a lot of this works and the pros and cons. But it, mix, it mixes in these pieces of flash fiction. Um, so you either have these dystopian or utopian um, societies as a result of this. So it says, you know, we're probably gonna end up using geoengineering, but what happens when we let that genie out of the bottle? Is it going to, you know, widen inequalities that already exist? Is it going to solve some of the inequalities that already exist? Um, you know, just to take a random example, I don't know if this is touching the book, but it's my personal analogy. If we can say reverse uh, certain aspects of uh, global warming or climate change with a geoengineering to help out a country like maybe India that is lower in the, the flood zone, you know, that could be very beneficial. Even if, say, the U.S. is doing this for selfish reasons to, um, you know, help their own coastlines. However, if we use geoengineering just as a band-aid so that we can keep extracting resources out of the earth with no penalty, at least less penalty, you know, then that could uh, graden the gap, graden, graden, that could lengthen the gap of inequalities. Um, the reason I kept thinking of this book over and over again is because it touches on a few utopias. 
And going forward into the coming year, that's something I really want to focus on. I want to learn politics, philosophy, learn about technology and social implications of how to build the best world, maybe just as an individual, but also if any of y'all uh, get influenced, ew, influenced. But <laughs> if y'all take any parts of this home, um, you know, maybe there's more of us that are working towards the same goal or similar goal and we can actually make somewhat of a difference. So I'm thinking about how to build this world or just theorizing of what it would even take and coming back to the ideas and kind of these solar punk themes, utopian themes that are in some of these pieces of flash fiction is something that's really stuck with me over the last half of 2021. Um, personally, I got a ton of value out of this book. I think it's a fun read for anybody. Some parts are a little academic, but if you're not getting them, just skip ahead. They're, they're, it's mainly only the science parts of the specifics of how technology works in certain cases. I don't think it's a, quite a need to know if you're not interacting with it directly. All right, second book we have is The Science and Technology of Growing Young by Sergey Young. Um, Sergey Young is an investor in the longevity and radical life extension space. He is not a scientist in the traditional regard like a David Sinclair or an Arbery de Grey or somebody like that is. And I originally rated this book four out of five as well. The reason being is I personally didn't get a lot of uh, value out of it because I'm a little bit more read on the topic and this is a more glossary book. Now, the reason it's in this list is because as I thought more and more about it and as I was making recommendations to people who are interested in this space, this quickly became one of the top books I was recommending. The reason being is it takes a good foundation of science, a good foundation of speculation, and mixes in a little bit of what you can do now, and it's just fun to read. So we touch on certain aspects of the science, where we're currently at and what like obstacles we have to get around in order to make longevity or radical life extension possible. Um, we talk about what life would look like if we can live past 120, 150 or 200 years old. Um, so we have a little bit of futurism and a little bit of inspiration to actually chase this goal. But we also talk about some of the ethics related to that, um, just in minor detail, which is really interesting. And, um, you know, it's got this kind of fun storytelling narrative to it that makes it a very easy read. So not only does it fill you in about a little bit of the science and what you can do now to personally try to get yourself to the point where the science can take care of you from there, um, it also talks about world building and what we would want in a future that we can solve the problem of aging in. So it is a fun read that takes on a lot of different topics and is very readable for a newcomer to the subject. And I really like this as opposed to maybe recommending Sinclair's uh, Lifespan. Solid book, but it talks about very narrow research in his domain. It talks about sirtuins and uh, genetic engineering with Yamanaka factors and his science with uh, his new study with the rat and regrowing the uh, the eye, the, the optical cord with um, stem cells, that's really cool, but it's kind of niche. Similarly, Aubrey de Grey's Ending Aging is a cornerstone book of this space, but it is so dense and rigorous that it's near unreadable for non-academics, myself included. And I think that's the perfect space this, this book fills. It's, it's a readable introduction to the topic that is grounded well, <laughs> it is it is firm on its science, but speculative speculative in its future, which makes it fun, in my opinion. And this is going to uh, piggyback into the third favorite book of the year, which is New Methuselahs by John K. Davis. And now New Methuselahs here, The Ethics of Life Extension. This is put out by MIT Press, and it's a fairly rigorous but readable book. And what I mean by that is this takes you on a journey of the full ethical landscape and implications of actually solving the problem of aging. Um, so we're first gonna start out the book by talking about the science and it's gonna lay out, you know, we know with some percent of confidence that we can probably solve aging. This is a solvable thing. You know, we have to fix a few problems with the body and it's not gonna be an easy undertaking, but 
we can probably do it. it kind of gives you that little dose of what is and isn't possible and talks briefly about, you know, if we can extend aging, is it going to be till 150 or 200? Or are we talking about an indefinite rejuvenation process that we could live thousands of years? And then it goes into some mathematical models, which are kind of cool saying, you know, what is the rate of accidental death? You know, you're going to solve this part from breaking down your mind from getting Alzheimer's and whatnot, but you can still get hit by a bus. So what is the average lifespan of somebody who, you know, is living in a society that solves aging? And then the real juice of the ethical conversations. Is life extension only going to be available to the rich? How do we prevent that? If it is only available to the rich, what are the ethical implications? How bad is that? Is that going to create a corporate capitalism gone wild? What is the end run of that? And just really goes into all these really interesting topics. Um, we talk about you know the equality. How do we spread this technology? Who gets it first? Is it ethical for it to be a slower rollout, or do we need to hold it back till we can give it to everybody at once? What is the grief it causes in somebody's mind knowing somebody else can live to a thousand and you can't because you can't afford it? Um, similarly, what about overpopulation? You know, right now, first world countries are actually declining in birth rates. But if you start having people that live to a thousand, you have a kid once every hundred years, population start going up. Do we have to do a lottery to decide who can have kids? Or do you have to give up life extension in order to pass that on to a kid that can then live forever, but you have to forego your longevity rejuvenation treatments? It is a super juicy and really thoughtful book put out by a proper professor of bioethics. Um, I believe that's what he is, John K. Davis here. It's a bioethic books, and I know he's a professor. I don't know if that's a specific domain, but if you have any opinion on if life extension is good or bad, this is a really fun read. However, if you're not into the topic, skip it. You're not going to get a lot out of it. I'm going to be honest. You have to have some type of emotional response to uh, either loving or hating the idea of longevity. And hey, I had some opinions changed in it. You probably will too. And to bring this back to my original point, why I kept thinking about this. Going into next year, I want to do a little bit of work in my community. I want to grow food for the homeless. I want, I want to help create a better world and squash some of the inequalities that this book talks about. You know, I can't be over here pushing for living forever or dying trying without realizing that if gets, this gets into the wrong hands of people or we don't fix portions of society before this comes around, we're just going to increase that gap of inequalities. And no matter how bad I want radical life extension, what would be the quality of my life knowing that I live in a society that is even more unjust than it is now? Um, so this, the ethics of life extension kind of deepened my pros and cons of ending aging. I still think it is a net benefit, probably one of the biggest humanitarian things we can do, you know, ending disease, suffering and aging, but we need to make sure it can be rolled out to everybody and what that means. But yeah, that's uh, my top three books of the year. As always, I'll leave links to these in the uh, little thing below. Um, let me know your thoughts on these. If you're going to pick any of these up or if these are too niche and obscure for you, and let me know what your top three books of the year were. And as always, if you can like or subscribe, you will uh, convince our Google overlords that I'm worth watching and we'll have some new friends in this little community. Until next time, peace.